If someone brought up the term Tourette syndrome, what kinds of things would come to mind? Most of us probably don't really know a lot about it, but today we are going to learn a bit more about this disorder. And Jerry Firth joins us from Lethbridge. He is the coordinator of the annual Trek for Tourette fundraiser, uh, which just occurred a couple weeks ago in Lethbridge. So he's here in Lethbridge. Welcome to Bridge City News, Jerry. Great to have you on. And I understand that 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 uh, fundraiser took place at Legacy Park and it was quite successful. Yes, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here and thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit more of about course. Tourette syndrome. Of course. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, let's find out first of all what your connection is with Tourette syndrome. Is this something that you yourself have been diagnosed with or perhaps someone close to you? Yeah, our oldest child uh, who's now the age of, well, almost 17 now, um, was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome at the age of six. Uh, myself and our youngest child also have tics, which is the most common um, trait within Tourette syndrome, but it's a, it's a part of a host of what would be known as uh, tic disorder. Um, neither of us have been formally diagnosed, uh, at, at least not at this point. Um, we also have um, other uh, individuals in our life that we know that live with and are affected by Tourette syndrome. Okay, so what kind of a disease is this and what are the symptoms? You did mention the tics there. Yeah, so Tourette syndrome is a neurological disorder, which means it affects the brain and other uh, nerves within the body. Uh, so this disorder involves repetitive and involuntary movements known, uh, sorry, movements and sounds known as tics. Uh, it's part of a group of tick disorders and is the most severe of these types of disorders. Okay, so can you maybe describe what some of these various types of ticks, uh, what the symptoms sort of look like? Certainly. Uh, so ticks present differently for everyone. It can range on a scale of severity uh, from minor to uh, uh, rather large and uncontrollable. Uh, movements can be present in any part of the body. That would include the face, neck, arms, legs, and so on. Uh, it could include things like flinching, twisting, um, flinging, among other movements. Um, the vocalizations could include things like humming, grunting, coughing, and vocalizing certain words or phrases. Uh, for example, uh, with our child, uh, humming is something that's quite present for them. And uh, they also have various words uh, or phrases that they might repeat. Um, they uh, have an arm flinch that they do when they, they flick out their, their arm to the side. Uh, but of course, throughout um, the development uh, of, of Tourette syndrome that they've been living with, uh, their tics have changed and morphed. Uh, for myself, for example, I also have, uh, most of my tics happen in my face. I also have a bit of a shoulder roll or a shoulder shuffle. Uh, you might actually end up seeing that uh, at various times within uh, this interview. Um, and then when I'm uh, often um, preoccupied with watching TV or something, I, I will do a ticking noise with my mouth. Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's, it's different for everyone and can look and sound different, um, and those ticks can change uh, throughout the lifetime. Yeah, you mentioned the change there. Is this something that can gradually increase over time, or does it more decrease? Does it affect younger people more than older people? Do you grow out of it ever? Yeah, good question. So it it, it typically does change, and the the more it's more common with children. Um, people into the adulthood can live with Tourette syndrome, but often it does decrease. And in many cases, it can actually even uh, go away in time. Um, that's not true for everyone, uh, but it, I would say that it's more severe uh, among young people. Okay, all right. Now, we often see Tourette syndrome depicted in the movies as people who maybe like swear uncontrollably. That's kind of what it's known for. But how much reality is there to that? Certainly, yeah. So movies and other popular media often depict, uh, depict Tourette syndrome on the higher end of severity. Uh, the uncontrollable swearing is often known as uh, what's called, uh, see if I get the term right, coprolalia. Uh, in reality, only about 10% of people impacted by Tourette syndrome display vocal texts that would consist of things such as the socially inappropriate cussing or swearing. Um, this depiction, unfortunately, can be incredibly harmful and continues to 
provide the misconceptions of what Tourette syndrome is. Yeah, no, for sure, definitely. Now, are people with Tourette's are completely aware of the tics that, that are occurring or do they try to stop them from happening? Yeah, I would say it, for the most part, um, there, there is some awareness. Uh, I would say specifically amongst the more severe tics, uh, they're pretty hard to, to be missed by anyone, including the individual. Uh, there are times, though, where it becomes a bit of a normal function and you may not acknowledge or recognize them. And others uh, who are familiar with you also may not acknowledge them. And as I had mentioned earlier, that uh, some of them can look like normal um, actions or behaviors uh, by an individual. So they might go unnoticed uh, by, by others and themselves. Unfortunately, though, some of the more severe um, tics can be quite uncomfortable and painful even at times. Uh, for example, our child has one where they thump their chest pretty hard and uh, that can be quite hurt, um, hurtful for them. So yeah. those, those types of ticks obviously are ones that they're quite aware of. Um, but like I said, they're, they are uncontrollable and involuntary. So um, there are times that you can um, work to try to suppress them, but that can be very difficult for, for most. Mm -hmm. How common is this disease and does it impact one gender more than the other? Sure. Uh, so tick disorders, so Tourette syndrome is a part of uh, a group of tick disorders and uh, tick disorders affect about one in 100 children and Tourette syndrome is more uh, around one in 160. It tends to affect males more than females. Uh, I think it's a three in one ratio to a four in one ratio, somewhere around there. Um, uh, and uh, it, it shows up and presents differently uh, amongst males and females in, in some ways as well. Interesting, like in, in what way? Uh, just with regard to, um, uh, er, well, when it presents itself, uh, males typically end up presenting a little bit earlier in life than females. Um, and there are um, there are more prevalence with some of the the motor tics. I understand. Okay, uh, what age group does it typically affect? I know you've mentioned uh, that you've got young kids even that have it. Does it usually start pretty young? Yeah. So the first signs of Tourette syndrome usually occur between the ages of about five and ten. Now they can occur as early as the age of twelve or even later. Uh, up to the age of 18 is when you might st first start seeing um, ticks occur. They usually start out pretty mild in nature, often with the head, neck, or face, and then uh, later present uh, throughout other uh, parts of the body, and, and the severity can increase over time as well. But yes, usually usually in younger ages is when it starts, and, you, and, and as I mentioned, you can eventually start to grow out of them, and most people do, uh, whereas some, it, they might live with it for their life. Wow. Uh, do you know how many people have been uh, diagnosed with this in uh, southern Alberta or in the Lethbridge area? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I don't think there's any stats um, available uh, for this particularly, at least nothing that I could find that was accessible. Uh, but if we can imagine one in about 160 children being affected, um, I'm not sure exactly where we are with the population of children, but at 100,000 plus people in Lethbridge, I would say there's probably uh, two, 300 individuals that are likely affected or living with TS. Wow, incredible. Um, so what, what do we know about the cause of Tourette syndrome? Is it genetic or can the environment around us sort of contribute to it? Certainly. Yes. Yeah, so the cause, the, the exact cause itself is unknown. Um, they, they continue to do research around this area and have not yet found any direct correlation. Uh, there are um, both uh, genetic and environmental um, effects that then can play a role with Tourette syndrome. We do know that it is pretty common uh, within families, so genetics, genetics do play a role and it can be intergenerational. Um, now with, uh, with it, because there's, there's no real understanding of the cause, there's also currently no cure for Tourette syndrome. However, there are certain treatments that can include things like medication, relaxation techniques, and psychotherapy. Okay. Well, that, that at least brings some sort of relief, hopefully. 
Um, is Tourette syndrome in any way associated with ADHD or OCD? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's actually, well, the term would be that's often used as comorbidity, uh, but certainly uh, Tourette syndrome is often accompanied by any of those uh, other neurological disorders, whether it be attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, oppositional defiance disorder, or um, uh, OCD itself. Um, and so uh, each of those might um, create new dynamics or have different effects or impacts on, on how um, TS might be present, and then also create some other uh, complexities and, and complications um, as a result. Wow. Uh, obviously, it has an uh, impact on the individual themselves, but what about, uh, what, what type of impact would it have on the family unit? Yeah, certainly. So, again, it, I think it would often depend on the individuals who are um, uh, affected by Tourette syndrome and, and how the uh, other neurologic disorders that they might experience would impact their lives. Uh, this could have an effect on behavioral um, attributes, um, academics, uh, social behaviors, etc. Um, so it, it would very much depend on many factors in that way. Um, but it, I think that a lot of the, the challenges that come with it is because it's such a misunderstood diagnosis that there's also all, often a lot of social stigma. Plus, there's also uh, minimal resources available to individuals and families affected. Um, uh, with that social stigma that exists as well, you can also feel like um, often a, an isolated experience for the individual and families. Um, and so, uh, again, it, it, it would range, but uh, I can speak from our family experience. Uh, it's been um, uh, an incredible journey uh, of many highs and lows and some, some often very difficult mm -hmm conversations and some difficult um, interactions and engagements, both with uh, our child and ourselves, but also with the professionals and other resources that we try to interact and engage with, often trying to explore um, pathways uh, for the success of our child. Yeah, wow, yeah, I'm sure it hasn't been an easy road for sure, but hopefully it's brought you together a little bit closer as a family. In many ways it has, um, especially around uh, us, um, uh, taking on a lead in coordinating the Trek for Tourette. It's something that when we first started as a family, shortly after our child was diagnosed, um, it gave us a sense of community uh, where we, we weren't the only ones that, that were living um, it, it with, with a child affected by TS and um, also uh, help us to better just explore and have conversations uh, about what does it mean to live with TS and um, have uh, have conversations with others in our lives as well, our family and friends about what that might look like. Right. Now, speaking of which, is there like, you know, what type of help is there out there for kids who struggle with self-esteem from this stigma surrounding TS? Yeah, certainly. Um, so there, there are some professional supports that exist um, locally. Uh, of course, there's some common things around uh, um, accessing counseling services. Uh, we are fortunate enough to be able to have access to that uh, with our child at a very young age um, through AHS, um, Child and Youth Mental Health Supports. Uh, there's also a, a local physician who's a pediatric um, um, uh, neurologist, uh, and then we also have access to a psychologist, um, or sorry, a psychiatrist. And uh, so a lot of those professional supports um, have been wonderful. We, we have looked at and explored um, other potential supports in Calgary at the Children's Hospital there, where they have uh, specialization in Tourette syndrome. Um, but of course, the travel uh, it creates and poses its own challenges. Uh, but of course, uh, We've been fortunate as a family to to be uh, within family or sorry um, schools that have been incredibly helpful and supportive. However, again, with the Tourette syndrome being rather misunderstood um, and uh, just unfamiliar for most people, that um, the school setting 
has probably been one of the greatest challenges to try to explore and navigate. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, with that said, any advice for schoolmates as to how to respond or interact with a fellow student who might have TS? Certainly, yeah, and I appreciate this question. So our child, uh, shortly after they were diagnosed, we encouraged them to share uh, about what Tourette's syndrome is and what it means to them and how they live with it um, so that there can be this familiarity with it. Um, really, I think if if anything, it's important that people understand that um, the movements and vocalizations are involuntary. Um, most people who are living with TS um, struggle with, with the perception uh, when they might be seen as being interruptive. So I think it's important not just for the classmates, but for the teachers to also know that there's no intention uh, in that area. And um, uh, there are things that can be done uh, to help in those situations. One, not just the understanding, but also sometimes um, stress can induce tics. So if, if a student is struggling in a setting and, and tics are being set off by their stress levels, to just provide uh, uh, another space for them, perhaps um, some, some quiet space for a while, uh, also maybe make some accommodations that they're able to do some learning or some, some of their exams um, at a different time or a different location. So uh, it would depend on the individual, but uh, I think it's really just about having understanding and, and starting some conversations about what, what are the needs to help uh, be supportive for the individual, but obviously not in a way that's going to create more burden or, or um, challenges for the school, uh, but rather create um, some partnership where everyone can benefit. Yeah, definitely good advice there. And, uh, you know, education is always the best tool. But it looks like we're out of time. But thanks so much, Jerry, for being with us for this very informative discussion on Tourette's syndrome. And all the best to you and your family, of course. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be here. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, of course. Jerry Firth is the coordinator of the annual Trek for Tourette fundraiser for the Lethbridge Tourette Group. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.